Hi, everyone. We are the Systems Change Alliance, and we believe that the world is in need of major change at a systemic level. Change is already happening in a lot of places around the world. In this series of interviews, we talk to people who are leading change and living the alternatives to the mainstream ways of doing things. Today, we welcome Carol Manetta. Is that right? Manetta? Yes. Carol yes. Manetta. Founder and Dir Executive Director of Reap Goodness. She's also authored two books on skills to overcome challenges posed by co-ops, challenges posed to or co-ops, I think that should, should be, and uh, has developed a plan to rescue people and planet in tree as a worker, co worker cooperatives. Welcome, Carol. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Alexander. So Reap Goodness, this is your organization. What does it do exactly? Oh, we're doing some really unusual things. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about those in pieces because it's so complex. We chose complexity. Hmm. And uh, so when we go through our interview, it'll break it down a little bit more for the audience. But we're hmm. essentially trying to restore the planet and store water uh, from rainfall and also clean waters that are polluted and hmm. provide permanent food for all people and all animals to stop their extinctions. That's a big job. So we have to break that down into sections and pieces. Okay, but it's a, it's a clear direction. Oh, we yes. know where we're going, yeah? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, okay, so what what presided over your thinking in starting such, such a project? Well, um, you know, it took courage to rethink the systems I was developing in hydroponics at a time. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, as a cure-all for water shortages. Yes, hydroponics takes uh, considerably less water than land agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, uh, we looked at the earth as a sponge. That's unusual. The earth is a sponge. That part of earth science was not learned in school. I, I didn't learn it. And with the idea of earth being a sponge and the land absorbs water at differing rates in differing places, mm -hmm. It occurred that there could be a constructive way to hold more water in dry soils, since so much of Earth's land surface has been desertified. Right. These arid lands need uh, rejuvenation right now. I live uh, in a semi-arid space called Arizona. Mm -hmm. It's thought that that name is a derivative of arid zone. <laughs> so while the notion of being arid, it, it's on the minds and hearts of all the citizens over here. Mm. Uh, and they don't think the land uh, of the land is a potential solution, but just a problem. Mm. No one taught them that the land holds water like a sponge. Mm. They knew that there was water underground since they dig wells here. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but they weren't sure exactly how it got so far beneath the Earth's surface. They just right. know it's there. So uh, now city folks like me, uh, we, we never gave it a thought as to where water comes from. We know it rained, uh, but water after that thought was openly available from a, a, like a faucet in the home. In fact, several faucets and toilets. Hmm. The pipes were there already when our homes were first occupied and they worked. And so there was no need to think any further. And to learn that many people had no drinking water in uh, many of the places around the world, they didn't trigger any action-minded thoughts. It was just, oh, oh, that's terrible for them. When I learned that this was true right here in Arizona with the indigenous tribe, the Navajo, uh, they're actually called Diné. I was appalled. Uh, I thought hydroponics would be the ticket. Then I saw this was occurring closer to the cities where the cattle, that's a traditional agriculture norm here. In fact, that's in our state flag and pictures of cattle are in our state flag. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were a major cause of drinking water contamination and shortages. Some wells are now going dry close to the cities and even in rural areas where the cattle are roaming uh, as a result. Uh, but the action plan for a new system really stemmed from learning uh, that a coal company for 30 years used the underground water on the Navajo people's land to pipe that coal to large cities in a neighboring state and in Arizona. Right. So that company, I won't name it, but that company completely drained the Navajo aquifer underground. It's slowly returning, but this is going to take years for that to happen. So uh, to get to the heart of your question, for now, um, the emphasis is to take my background in instructional design 
as design, development, and testing of training to design systems and their instructions and to get those instructions to the people around the world to tackle the water issues and, and the land agriculture issues that uh, follow, of course. Uh, so a total of 12 years of research have yielded the results of analyzing cultural norms and how those systems have failed and what can be done to reverse the unhealthy systems with new ones. And that's it. So what systems are you looking into using in, in this project? Okay, uh, well, actually we're incorporating many systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so taking into account the, uh, all these sweeping changes that are needed on the planet. Now this is for permanent food for all. That's our main goal, permanent mm -hmm. food for all, people as well as animals. So we have the following systems that are rolled into our plan. I've got them numbered here for you. First is improvement of water drainage patterns on earth. And that can be done, has been done. And two, that's uh, swales design. Those are uh, water catchment ditches to mm -hmm. develop those and for ponds that those curve with the land to hold water inside earth. Remembering that sponge-like quality and then three, uh, we are doing the planning and planting of permaculture food forests. That's not new, but we're going to be doing that in combination with some annual crops at first, mm -hmm. uh, so that until things get uh, uh, established. And fourth, we're going to develop the swales into large ponds for Earth's animals, the birds and insects, so they may have water. Uh, to protect them from extinction, because they're we all know they're going into extinction so quickly. So we want to protect them. And then five, we're developing or taking advantage of, no one's no one else is doing this, <laughs> existing roadside ditches with water cleansing plants to prevent the plastics from tires wearing out. You know, I always wonder when my tires wear out, where does the worn out part go? Well, mm -hmm. apparently they go into the ditches on the side of roads and um, they have other pollutants as well in those ditches. And those enter, we wanna prevent them from entering into the land water systems from um, the subsequent flow into streams, rivers, and eventually the ocean, because that's where the worn out parts of tires all around the world end up as microplastics in the ocean. And that goes into the, wild, the wildlife in the ocean. And six, uh, we're doing preservation of species of edible plants mm -hmm. that are not known to most humans. Uh, that's based on their nutritional density. So these are gonna be permaculture plants that are not known. There are worldwide, there are over 30,000 edible plants in nature. And if you go into a supermarket, a grocery store today, how many are there? So we they've been reduced, so we, we want to find out more about these species of edible plants. We want to work with chefs, but they're all going to be based on their nutritional density. That will have priority. Okay. And seven, the last one, we're going to be planting permaculture forage for wild animals. And that's also going to be based on their nutritional density in, uh, as a priority in their sanctuary spots. Again, no one is really doing that either specifically based on nutritional density. Now, all those components are systems in and of themselves. And all of them have been proven quite successful in places around the world separately for mm -hmm. the most part. Okay, and it's with those proven systems that we're choosing to gather them together as a large scale effort to make changes around the earth much faster than they are occurring at this, at, right now at this time. So with current technologies and the mindset of the people to make the changes, we have the ability to create training that's available to all uh, in a hurry, a real hurry. And that includes putting the training into eBooks and developing a virtual reality overview of the whole process. So that's so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, of course. And then recording our trial of this systems development in a documentary. And that one is going to go onto YouTube. So uh, the justification of taking such a large set of systems and putting them together is the time factor of urgency. And I think we're all aware of this urgency. Yeah, it's, it does seem very urgent at the moment. So, so um, 
Do you think we need to completely transform the way we do agriculture everywhere? Uh, yes. Well, we, we, view, we view systems holistically. Hmm. And that is uh, our, our bravery to do this stems from seeing sets of systems interlaced currently that disregard Earth's natural systems. Right. Uh, which are also, the Earth's natural systems are interlaced as we know. So mm -hmm. tackling just one issue has its benefits. And, and yes, there's some ripple effect from those individual activities that are being done around the Earth. Mm -hmm. However, uh, our systems intend to join together with other systems and interlace to replace those sets of systems that are currently disregarding Earth's natural ecosystems. And those are also interlaced as, as we know. Oh, so, this, so it's not just agriculture, there's other things as well that should... Absolutely, should absolutely. There's water systems, the ditches and all those. These are, these are all interlaced systems mm -hmm. with nature and we, we, we don't live separately from nature and these systems are not separate, they're all interlaced. So we're going to prosper those ecosystems with teams of individuals interlacing their intentions first. Okay, from that point, um, these teams, these cooperatives, uh, can determine to work together or separately to uh, approach the set of systems that they're responsible for to achieve their maximum effect. So that's why we chose to uh, step back and look at the world as a whole and all of its interlaced systems. And those were the guidance for us. And those were the inspiration. Um, so then we looked around at the capabilities of humans as uh, evidenced by the individual tasks done on behalf of Earth. And we studied those a lot. And some that were so successful in their own right. But so now we're thinking of sewing these together with a, a thought thread. And that was relatively easy to do after looking at those. Um, yes, the uh, research needed to be done to uh, ensure that the individual tasks, like growing food forests, for mm -hmm. instance, were successful in geographic zones and topographies as, as far as we could find all over the earth. When we found that, when we knew that happened, we could see the changes from current agriculture practices to phenomenal natural transformations before our eyes. We see that with food forests, that's just one system. But we could see these in our minds and we knew that the, uh, the evidence of harm from conventional agriculture, both plant-based and animal agriculture uh, could be rectified with new systems that are already proven. So wow. as we learned of land degradation, because uh, we know that from brownfield sites, land degradation, water pollution, water shortages, and ill health in areas surrounding these forms of current agriculture, mm -hmm. there was no hesitancy on our part to uh, say there needed to be change. Now, in addition, after learning about our own human internal microbiome 15 years after first learning about soil microbes, those puzzle pieces clicked into place that we needed to restore both of them, the soil microbes and those within us too, to mm -hmm. make us resilient uh, health-wise. Mm -hmm. So how do you track the big picture of, of what's the results of this? Okay, so our plans for the um, biologic changes, um, it's clear uh, that up till now, humanity has relied on a series of chemicals that are man-made. Mm -hmm. I'm told from my research is telling me that over 80,000 chemicals have been created by man and only a small handful of those have ever been tested for human health or uh, health in the environment and with the animals. So um, uh, we've relied on these to enhance agriculture for output and also for profit. Okay, so we choose to use biology and the natural chemistry underneath it to make the changes very quickly at the beginning of what we plan. Mm -hmm. So that systemic interplay between natural forces allows for great opportunities for plant growth and for harmonizing all the elements on earth. Let's take uh, rain, for example. As we systematically harness rainfall on any kind of a slope, in particular, a gentle slope, those are, are the best. Uh, this allows rain to stop in place, to soak in 
and begin to forge an alliance with the soil and the microbes that are in the soil. And this could happen very quickly with one rainfall. Think of that. So with this harnessing well-planned, the soil's moisture can begin to start supporting plants that are intended to stay in place for a very long time. And with that in mind, our plan can set up the beginnings of a food forest in just the first year. That wow. is part of our trial, the Heartland Trial Project is what we're calling it. So remember what we're trying to do here physically has been done elsewhere in the world quickly. Our trial is to test the system of a trio of worker cooperatives and, and how they make plans and the agreements that go with them. This has never been done before in human history. So these agreements and the nature of their outcomes are what's going to be recorded quickly within that one year. Uh, the good eBooks that we're creating for the training um, can then be translated and distributed within the following year. So this is a very short period of time. And then suggestions for reading additional books on the physical nature of what we're doing, because that's already been done, are going to be contained in our eBooks for further reading and instruction. Okay, so all the biologic changes uh, are going to be filmed at close range for the world to see just how fast these kinds of changes can take place systematically. There will also be uh, human gravitational forces among the three worker cooperatives being tested so that uh, people can see the biologic changes along with the social formations mm -hmm. that can take place just as quickly. Because people, when people get together, they can make their minds up very quickly if they agree, if they agree on it. And that's to encourage the formation of these worker cooperatives anywhere in the world. So allowing for the timing of ebook development, quick distribution, and we know that it can happen quickly because we've already done two ebooks and how fast it went out to be sold to people in other countries was astounding to me. Uh, and, and then the translations, of course, to occur uh, fast on the heels of the original ebooks, uh, the world can be prepared to take on these new systems in less than three years. That's our plan. Mm -hmm. Now, once the maintenance plan for the water systems and the food forestry systems are in place within the trial, uh, which is uh, one year of duration, the social systems of the trio of cooperatives remains the only factor that has not been tested worldwide. Since we're involving universities who are already aware of the biological benefits of what we're attempting, it remains up to them to report within their specific universities and then also share the information with other universities. We encourage them, but we don't have any control over their timing. We do, however, have control over the timing of the translations and the eBooks distribution. Mm -hmm. So for that, we're going to rely on ebook distributors, which we've already done, as well as libraries, community libraries. Those two ebooks we've already done, we put out and uh, through Amazon, they have a, a system of supplying libraries with electronic um, goods like ebooks, audiobooks, movies, and music. And because of that, our, these two books that we have done now are available in community libraries across all of North America. And we had nothing to do with that. It was part of that system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, because university students are going to be involved with this process and the trial, we assume that the respective universities are gonna develop a system of distribution through their own libraries. And this is due to the fact um, that it contains research done within departments of their own institutions. So they would probably be very happy to put that in their own libraries. So these eBooks are going to demonstrate a method of quickly attaining those biological improvements we talked about on earth, including food security for people and animals. That is our goal. And that's through those trios of cooperatives. Uh, as that information then goes out all around the earth and blankets the earth, there's gonna be a, a kind of a spinning out effect as people demonstrate their successes for others uh, who will see that on social media and on people's own websites. And that is going to be how we distribute. Hmm. I'm, I'm living in Portugal 
And um, some of the things you're describing remind me of the traditional Portuguese agriculture. We have a lot of um, terraces, uh, very old. I assume they're like a thousand years old terraces. Um, it's kind of funny, you go hiking in nature sometimes and you see these terraces and they just look like part of nature. But uh, obviously they're human made, but somehow the humans who made them did them in a way that was very much in touch with, with nature. And yeah. I assume that the purpose of the terrace is that exactly that thing of allowing the earth to act as a sponge and to let the rain in and to allow the trees to grow that otherwise would, would not be able to. Yes, in uh, my research on the terraces and the, the steps as they're called in Russia and so on, mm. uh, is that they are usually given over to a monoculture on each step. Mm. Uh, as opposed to a food forest per se, but they do, they, they stop the water along that slope and they take advantage right. of that to have more agricultural land. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I, I, in very, the places where there's very small agriculture, someone's little backyard, then you see a lot more diversity than when you see kind of large scale is, is much, much less. Um, and the, the other thing you see is a lot of, um, diverting of the rain, diverting of the water, so that there's a lot of the, the flow is consciously um, diverted in ways that it's not in the way of things, you know, it's not flowing over the, the road, instead it goes underneath the road into a pipe where it gets to be piped into the, into the ground somewhere and used in the, or, or just coming out of a pipe where you can fill up your bottle and drink it or, or whatever it is. And so that's, I don't see so much of it in the modern uh, modern development, but in the ancient times, there seemed to be a very conscious, a lot of consciousness about this kind of water uh, water use, which was quite impressive. Yes. So I'm beginning to see kind of what you're talking about. Um, so you're talking about a trio of cooperatives. What what would what would this look like? Through three different related cooperatives. Well. Um... We, yeah, we have, uh, we, we, we're going to trust each other to take mm. the world to the next step of, of health and harmony. Um, they know of the individual parts of what we're already doing since those are recorded uh, and those successes have been noted. While one group is preparing for another group to uh, arrive for this trial of the or trios of cooperatives, uh, they're going to see that this is the future for their own life and that of their children someday. Our current team is a set of graduate students from Arizona State University. Some of them are in engineering, uh, others in architecture and construction management and so on. And they're preparing for the other uh, graduate students to arrive on the site. And we're looking forward to having PhD students from universities who understand this work and whose interest is in um, the successful combination of trios of worker-owned cooperatives to uh, change the planet rather quickly. Since we have a lengthy list of visions as outcomes, it's going to be easy for them to picture what the successful trial period is going to yield, because that's one of the things that they'll see first, is the visions and, uh, as outcomes. And so uh, joining forces uh, together has brought about some great excitement for the potential of this project and the clear steps to get there. And that's what they wish to contribute to. So um, uh, we... Um, they tell me that uh, these students already feel very, very proud to be part of this journey that mm -hmm. we're moving together. And they have a clear sense of its importance, not only in the near term, but also for uh, the lengthy life of this planet and their own journey on it. Uh, so that's uh, the systemic change that makes sense to them. It's uh, since the older and current systems are no longer working for their benefit and that of their offspring in the future. They're of an age where they're thinking perhaps about having children themselves. And that's a, a worry, uh, but continuance means uh, survival, not of the fittest, but survival of all, we have to. That's becoming clearer and clearer as uh, all of us are affected by a pandemic and we're told that, uh, that more pandemics are to come. But with a healthy earth and vibrant health from natural plants that are intended for us by nature, if we have 30,000 of them around the world, obviously they're intended for us by nature. Um, it eases uh, their minds that there's a systemic result that they can count on, 
as well as be part of its uh, formation. And I can hear the excitement in their voice when they're, when they're on Zoom calls and hear the outcome of their work presented individually and together. It's also uplifting for me to know that they're excited about this and want to move forward as quickly as possible. Now, the uh, training for a trio of cooperatives. Okay, so the, uh, this is the why. Well, it's because joining forces has a multiplier effect. Instead of one worker cooperative tackling all those tasks and duties, uh, essentially many hands make light work. Okay, so as each one makes plans for their part in the overall picture, the others are taking part in their own plans to develop an integrated piece of that whole picture. Uh, don't be mistaken, what, what they're undertaking is very hard work. It's a way of uh, dividing and conquering a decimated earth that needs an army of do-gooders to restore the planet. And uh, it's been undermined for centuries, we know that. So the need to do this as quickly as possible mandates that it be done with many hands at the same time. So with consistency, the trio of cooperatives will accomplish a great deal in a fraction of the time that's done by one alone. This can actually be proven mathematically but uh, we don't need to do that. Instead, what we wish to emphasize with the trio of cooperatives is that the nature of cooperation slims down the chance of mistakes being made without recourse. So others are there for the rescue and should that be necessary. So time allows for uh, a precious means of delivery to encourage the speed of operations and the restoration of the planet. You know, without that set of trios of cooperatives, the earth would not recover in nearly the amount of time and time's not on our side, as we know, as we all know. So bringing together groups of cooperatives, starting with the set of a trio of cooperatives, allows for that ripple effect of natural systems to be cleansed and captured, nurtured and harvested, not only by humans, but by the animals and in the sanctuaries and on the roadsides and in all places where people will understand that nature needs to be restored. Okay, this is for the health and harmony of all the systems in nature. What's cleansed on the land will be cleansed in the oceans eventually. So, and we know this. So even though our work is intended to be on land using surface waters from rain, its effects are going to be felt worldwide by all living beings. This is a huge undertaking. So the trio of cooperatives are going to make light work of what would seem impossible to do in the amount of time that we have left to do this, which is very short as we know. What are the roles of these different cooperatives? Um, the, um, different, the roles of the different cooperatives are, the first one, is going to do the uh, digging of the uh, swales, these water catchment ditches. Mm -hmm. And they will also be creating some ponds. Okay, that's this, oh, those, uh, typically the water catchment ditches will end in a small pond to keep more water there as well. And it can go back into the swale if needed. That's theirs. They will also be teaching this in local schools. Um, uh, middle schools and high schools or secondary schools. And also if they need to, if there's a nearby community college, they'll be teaching about what they're doing. That's the first one. The second one is going to be the planning and the planting of the food forests and also uh, distributing what they have um, uh, that's over what they can eat themselves and also what they can distribute to the community. And they'll do that with gentle drying and uh, pickling and other healthy means of storage, mm -hmm. not the kind that we have today. The third one is going to be uh, taking charge of the polluted waters. And they'll be working with the roadside ditches. They'll also be carving out large ponds for the animal sanctuaries and planting the plants that are of a uh, high nutritional level for the animals. Mm -hmm. That's three. And you, these co-ops, uh, you call them co-ops, so I assume they are a financial entity that is going to be making money and paying its members. 
Well, they will with the, you know, the, the foods that they can uh, distribute. Mm -hmm. We're also, I'm glad you're really asking this question because what we're also incorporating in here is the sharing economies. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be, when, when they're established in these areas, we intend to increase the local economies to the extent we can or need to with money, but also exchanges, exchanges of food, and knowledge and so on to encourage sharing without money. Mm -hmm. That's sharing economies. So that's part of our vision as well. Okay. So where is this going to take place, your first, first trial? It's a beautiful piece of land in the southern part of Arizona. It's at mm -hmm. 4,700 feet. Uh, and I don't know what that is in meters. You'll have to do that math yourself. <laughs> 47,000, so it's something like 4,700 4, square feet. Yes, you I'll probably divide that by three. And you'll oh, no, square, square meters, did you say? Square feet. Meters. Uh, elevation. Elevation. 47,000. 47, yes, elevation. So it's something yes. like 15,000. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's 40 acres, and you have to divide that to get hectares. <laughs> that's, that's 10 okay. hectares. That's the land. We have a portion of that land and mm -hmm. we did visit it this past weekend. And uh, I'm very excited about it. It has a number of challenges which we can't wait for because the more challenges we have, the greater the example for places that have fewer challenges. You see, we can, we can tackle them all. The land is, uh, we have some land here in Arizona that is, has elements of concrete in it. You know, your concrete powders have to come from the earth somewhere. And we have land that's like that. It's called caliche. That's what the right. native population is called, caliche. And we also have sand and we have some loam, but so they have different ones and two uh, streams that go through it from a mountain range. It's uh, ringed by, it's almost completely ringed by mountains, uh, even though it's up 4,700 feet in elevation. Uh, so the water comes down from those mountains and two large streams go through it. And when they have a heavy rain, it causes a flash flood, which, is, which can be dangerous. And the roads nearby are impassable. So we're going to take advantage of all that water, stop it in stages, put it on the land. We're going to have to fence it off because these, uh, the cows, the cattle go through there, it's open range. And they have eaten down the trees until the trees are only as high as a very small bush. They cannot grow. So we will stop and allow the trees, spe specific trees, uh, mesquite trees, because they fix nitrogen in the soil. And mm -hmm. they also food. their pods, their long pods are edible. They are, uh, mesquite is uh, not known around the world so well, but it's, a, no. it's closely related to carob. And it looks a lot like carob, if you're familiar with it. Okay, okay. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous tree with, with many um, features to it. And so there is a great deal of mesquite on that land and also some cactus that is edible. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be planting another one. Uh, and on this land also, there are a great many rocks. There are rocks that are about the size of, of my fists together and others about this, with fists apart. Mm -hmm. And those are marvelous. We can move those and help make those uh, water catchment dams on, for the water itself. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are lots of opportunities there. Um, the person who owns the land is an engineering department head at Arizona State University. And he can't wait for this. He lived on that land with his family for six years. And they had one, um, one of the first solar panels that were ever created on that. And it's still on an old building there that has to come down. But this uh, also, we're going to be planting as a start, just as a starter some peach trees that are um, indigenous to the Navajo people. They're on high desert also. And these peaches are smaller than um, commercial peaches, but they're of much higher nutrition. Mm -hmm. Also be planting some pine trees that uh, have gone extinct in California. They've had the wildfires here, massive wildfires. And so the pine nuts that came from those trees are gone. All the pine nuts sold in the United States now are imported. So we're going to take the, these uh, few seedlings that are being produced by a university and plant them there. They are the largest of the pine nuts and they have the highest protein of any of the pine nuts in the world. So we're going to plant those as well. 
We're also working with a botanist who is from the Desert Botanical Garden here. And he's originally from Mexico. And he has developed a type of what they call prickly pear cactus, which has round pads on it. And his are larger and they have more vitamin C in them, several times more vitamin C than oranges. And uh, so we're, that's another one that we'll be planting, but that's just the start. The university's uh, trial students that are going to come there are going to be the determiners of the full capacity of that forest, but they will all be permaculture plants, of course. Do you look into the flavor of the, the fruit as well? Oh yes, uh, the peaches are extremely sweet. And these, uh, I've already tasted this, the prickly pear cactus. I've given some samples by the botanist and it's wonderful, e either raw or cooked. They can mm. either way, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. It tastes like a little bit like uh, uh, green beans or asparagus, a uh, wonderful flavor. And uh, oh, you're, talking about, you're talking about eating the leaves of the prickly pear, not the- Yeah, uh, well, they're only the pads. Fruit. They're only pads. There are no pads. other uh, separate leaves or branches. It's just uh, pads. Uh, like the pad of my hand and mm. several of them coming out, okay? And so the top pads are the ones that are harvested and they grow very quickly too, these, these that he has developed. Yeah, right, very cool. I've only eaten the fruit of prickly pear. Oh, yes. Well, I have done that too. I've picked that and I've made a little syrup out of that. It's, it's wonderful. And of course that's used by the uh, small animals. Mm. Uh, while we were up there this past weekend, there were these beautiful little blue, bright blue birds, tiny ones that seemed to be following us. They were landing in, in, in bushes right near us. Uh, so I can't wait. Oh, you need to know this too. You know what hummingbirds? Hmm. Yes. No. This land is very near the San Pedro River and the San Pedro River Valley is on the migratory path of the largest variety of hummingbirds in the world. So we will be planting flowers that attract the hummingbirds to help them on their migratory path going and coming. And so, and they're pollinators. So they will help the food forest and we will help them. Mm. Okay, so I have to correct some of the figures that I said before. So I heard you say 47,000 but it's 4,700, yes? 4,700 feet elevation. So it's 4,700, uh, so which is more like uh, one and a half thousand meters, not one, not 15,000 meters, which would be like uh, permanent permanent frost, which was not what we're talking about here. Um, and I, I also uh, miscalculated our, our acres to, uh, it would be more like, uh, um, 20 hectares, not 10, I believe. But that's, uh, that's someone else can look that up and, and get it right properly. Um, so it sounds like a, like it's a really arid place to, to some of us who live in uh, wetter forested places, it would, sounds a lot like a wasteland. One of the reasons why we wanted to do this here, because I, I'm originally from the state of Michigan, which has, mm. of course, the Great Lakes around it and lots of mm. water. Um, the reason we're doing it here is because of the desertification of so much farmland around the world. We know that it is desertifying at the rate of the size of our American state of Pennsylvania every year. That entire state is a large section of the United States every year and has been for a long time. And we've all seen the pictures of desertified land that's cracked and there are no microbes um, and worms making it wonderful, beautiful soil. And so we're taking this very arid place to transform it on purpose so that we can go to that desertified land, which is continuing to desertify so much that the United Nations has declared that in another 60 years, there will be zero farmland left if we don't do anything. It will all be desertified. Mm -hmm. So we are choosing desert to transform on purpose so that wherever it's at in the world, it doesn't matter if it's Africa or if it's mm -hmm. South America or places where there is desertification, uh, we can reclaim that soil, you know, turn that dead dirt into living soil very quickly. 
I saw a video and it was in Ecuador. Now you can imagine that Ecuador has a lot of rain, but in this video, they were showing land that had already gone into desertification, with cracked soil, that cracked dirt, that nothing was growing on in Ecuador. So it's happening, we know, all around the earth. So it gives us hope that we can be of help all around the earth. Mm. You wrote some books about overcoming challenges in co-ops. What kind of challenges do you see co-ops facing? Well, first of all, we wrote those books because of the fact that I had been on Zoom calls with actual participants in worker co-ops and their questions to the hosts uh, of these uh, meetings were basically on how the people had difficulty getting along. They didn't know how. It wasn't that they're bad people. They just didn't know how. And um, so, you know, I used to work in a major corporation. I understand that people, you know, will there's gossip by the water cooler, um, but that's one of the things that will fell a, a worker cooperative because it's the opposite of cooperation. It's separating oneself and separating others too with this gossip. That's just one kind of thing. But we also have need for them to understand how to function together as owners. And that's never been done. They've always come in and been hired by a boss, worked for a boss, mm. took orders from a boss. And if they needed to be, they were fired by a boss. And that is not how cooperatives function. So they needed to have ways to understand how to plan together, how to get over rough spots together, how to distribute money together, how to make decisions about suppliers together, if there are suppliers, and so on. So these, and, and also how to do envisioning. People are not very good at envisioning because in our school systems, and I used to teach in the schools, we're not taught how to plan. We're not taught about systemic thinking, and I know that's what you are about as well. And so we're not taught about many of the things that are required at a worker-owned cooperative. That is a system and a set of systems themselves. So they needed that kind of support in mm. a very clear way that that could be used again and again as a reference, a reference tool, a training tool, and a reference tool. And that's what we created with our two eBooks that already are published. Those I would consider for this prerequisite reading for those who are coming in for this trial and anybody else. So they will know what to do when they come together, how to do it harmonizing. The word harmony is the most important one. And um, to get over, again, some rough spots and also how to work together with uh, local economies, how to work together with local governments so they understand what's going on and um, to, to work in a way that they would look at this with great interest and support always. Mm. Harmony with the planet we're talking about and harmony with each other. I, I assume there's a third point, which is harmony with ourselves. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> That's first and foremost. If we don't have harmony within ourselves, how can we bring harmony to others? So as we look within, and I have I've done that over the years and had to change my thinking about many things, especially with old systems where we were very obedient to someone else. We need to be uh, obedient in terms of our harmony. If we harmonize and we can be obedient to our own harmony, if we find ourselves in a point of disharmony within ourselves, we'll know how to bring ourselves back into harmony. And then we can extend that to others and see the, um, I will use the term, the, uh, the godliness within all human beings and all beings, because we're all one. We're mm -hmm. interlaced, uh, the, these sets of systems are interlaced and they are based on harmony. As we study biological systems, I'm, I'm astounded at how they work. Let's just take ants, for example. We know they live in colonies, um, and I will give you one example of a researcher who went to an island, a, a university student uh, with a cohort. And this island is untouched. It's in, um, I think, the Canary Islands with beautiful forest, natural forest that's untouched. And the ants 
they went to the huge or overstory trees and found they had 35 species of ants. And these ants, as it turns out, they have a, a um, what do you call it? It's like a hormones. We've seen them walking in a line. Mm -hmm. They give mm -hmm. hormones out from the under, under belly of their bodies. And it turns out that those trees, those huge overstory trees rely on ants for those hormones and what they leave because they form ant houses on the sides of those trees. It looks like a cigar, long cigar, nine, nine, well, three meters long. And those ants inside those colonies have rooms. We know that from taking apart ant colonies. And inside those rooms, they have a bathroom. They don't go to the bathroom anywhere, but in that bathroom. And that bathroom is at the bottom of that ant hill and it drops, their, their uh, leavings are dropped onto the soil. Mm -hmm. And the researchers took those drops and into a lab and planted native plants from that forest. And those that had the ant droppings in them were twice the size of plants done in the soil without the droppings. So the tree, huge tree, relies on these ant droppings. And they did the math. They multiplied times the number of trees, how much they had in 24 hours of collection. And they realized that those ants provided tons of fertilizer every year for that forest. That's just one. And then of course, as they crawl up the tree, they come down the tree with pieces of leaves. And the, I'm sure the tree is saying, please, please take these leaves, I'll grow more. Thank you for your contribution to us. Mm -hmm. That's the harmony of nature. That's just one small example. Um, and of course we know about the pollinators. We have the caterpillars and Dr. Silas Rao, whom I'm, I'm going to uh, request that you have on here too. He has written books about this, that we humans have been behaving like caterpillars, consuming everything in our path. But now we're going through a chrysalis stage of change. We have to. And then we'll turn into butterflies, which then contribute to um, nature and to each other. Yeah, harmony. <laughs> I lived in um, desert Israel for a few years. And uh, I actually came from, from Australia I'd grown up in hot, um, uh, kind of dry summers, Mediterranean dry summers, not, not really arid, but fairly dry. But I never really liked it. I really liked the rain and I really liked the wet and I couldn't handle the sun. I go here to this desert Israel. It's hot, it's dry, but it was so beautiful. It was, I, I just fell in love with the landscape. Um, but the story that I'm trying to tell is about the compost. So people used to make a compost system that was really had been designed in a wetter climate. And so they had a compost system, they'd mix, it would sit up above the ground and they would mix in all of their different compost and put some dry grass and, and then they had to water the compost every day because it would dry out and, and, it, and turn it. And it seemed like so much work and so out of harmony in some sense that I, I took a year kind of experimenting with compost systems and found something that worked in that environment. And so we, we dug a hole, we put the compost in the hole, covered it with a bit of dirt and a bit of ashes and just left it there. Um, and so I, I developed this system that was working very well. And then I met a permaculture teacher and he came and looked at it and said, you can't make compost like that. <laughs> And then he dug it up and said, wow, actually you can, it's working. <laughs> so at one point I, I dug up the compost halfway through and looked at what was happening. And what was happening is that it was full of insects. So it wasn't a composted in the traditional way with micro, microorganisms. It was composted through the action of insects that were eating and leaving behind their, their poo, yeah? which was really good fertilizer. Yeah. So that was an interesting variation on this that I've seen in, in my travels. Oh, wonderful. Um, one of the things that we're going to be using is something I've tested over two years is myself, and that is EM1. EM1 is Effective Microorganisms. Uh, mm -hmm. It was developed by a Japanese agricultural scientist, Dr. Teruo Higa, and uh, back in the 1960s. He found a trio of microbes from the soil 
and uh, he and his colleagues were testing them. His colleagues were testing single ones, and he said, "That's crazy. We don't. We don't." I'm sure he didn't use the word crazy, um, <laughs> but this is. Um, they don't live alone. They might they live alone with, with each other. So he found three, uh, kind of by accident, that worked very well, and he devoted his life to these. And they, those are EM1. Uh, it's uh, lactobacillus, a yeast, and the smallest bacterium capable of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And they work very well together. And I've tested them. They're available throughout the world. Um, there happens to be uh, one uh, place where, and it's an, these are all nonprofits, by the way. Uh, they ha are um, cultured here in Arizona. So we are, can use them. And then they also have instructions on how you can uh, buy, we'll call it the mother batch and how to make daughter batch or child batches from the mother batch. And so that you can create your own after you buy the initial one. And this one, in terms of composting, I tested that here in the desert in a large earthen pot and put uh, kitchen scraps in there. And uh, uh, they said that, you know, they will compost in two weeks. And I thought, well, okay. I tested, I, out of curiosity, I went there after five days and all of the kitchen scraps, except for the orange peels, were already composted in five days. <laughs> yeah, so orange we, peels we normally yes. just leave out because they take so long. Yes, now they also use them because they come from the soil. They mm. use them for bioremediation. They use them in septic tanks They uh, for, for like public libraries there in Japan. And also you remember the Fukushima disaster. Yeah. Well, they tested it on farmlands that were contaminated and uh, they um, tested it by spraying these on there with uh, water, you know, and they have their own solution. And, uh, and with the first test, I only read about the first result and it had taken down the radiation by 20% compared to the fields on either side of it. So they will take down for media, uh, uh, radiation. Uh, amazing, amazing. So wherever we have these brownfield sites, We'll start with EM1 to mm -hmm. give those microbes to the soil and give them a head start. They also take away smell, terrible smells. So where they had pig farms in Japan, they spray the ceiling, walls, floor over the pigs. Yes, right on the pigs. And the pigs are healthier. And there's the smell goes away in one day. Wow. One that day. Yes. And so they continue to do that. They've put it in their feed and found that the animals are far more healthy. And so they don't get the automatic um, antibiotic shots anymore. And that makes the veterinarians a little bit disturbed because it's a loss of income. For them. <laughs> but um, so we know that it's healthy for animals too. This is of critical nature. So we'll be using that as well. So when do you expect this new system to be have measurable change to be able to see the results? Well, we have some, I have some figures here. All right, we anticipate it should take about three years, at least three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and more than likely it's gonna take about five years for the change to be understood and felt by all around the world. Uh, uh, botanists will take note of the changes as will all the, uh, the animal studies sectors from the universities. Now, uh, humans were, are gonna know that they have permanent food available to them starting in the second year of our operation and in, any others like it. So food forestry allows for smaller, younger plants to yield some crops immediately, but the trees of course take a, a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, this, we, uh, we already know from perennial foods that people are familiar with. So uh, the water testing will show results in less than a year. Uh, the plants that we'll be using that cleanse water are effective within a season. And as they multiply, the results will be even clearer as the uh, water is clearer. Now, uh, continuance of that program allows for uh, these industrial brownfield sites to see the systemic change within the five-year period. That's going to take a little bit longer as the, the microbes do their work in dismantling the, the chemical structure of what was dumped on the lands in the form of chemical discharges, as well as the uh, pesticides from agriculture. So uh, cleanup microbes, these EM1 uh, microbes for bioremediation are almost instantly available to do their work. Uh, but yet there's a lot of work to do. 
So these microbes are going to multiply and uh, they'll add additional beings under the soil. <clears throat> Once they're there, <clears throat> excuse me, they provide uh, food for other beings and uh, such as worms. And so when that happens, the cleanup is going to speed up exponentially. So as new and effective engineering takes place uh, in terms of cleaning up the atmosphere too, and those are the jobs of the future, uh, the exponential growth of those plants uh, uh, that breathe freely in the ecosystem surrounding them is going to speed up their growth in a way that's going to take our breath away, I believe. Now, mm -hmm. ours is a starter project only in the sense that we're developing the training for a trio of worker cooperatives. So let's remember that the individual tasks these good people will do have already been done and are already proven. But with the training, the spread of that notion of the uh, trios of cooperatives are going to normalize the functioning on many lands and in many languages as we do the uh, translations. And they're going to replace many of the unproductive systems of today. So uh, as those successes are recorded and broadcast and people around the world are going to see those proofs very quickly, they're going to wish to jump on board a successful bandwagon. We, that's the way people are. That's the nature of human beings, isn't it? Um, so their love for one another and the earth knows no bounds and uh, neither do we. You know, I, I like the story of uh, Curitiba, the town in Brazil where they, they did a lot of work that was, it started with trying to preserve the architecture and then trying to make some nice places for people to hang out in the city, pedestrian malls and put on some festivals. And it was very human centered. There wasn't much talk about environment, but all of the environmental indicators in that city went up. Um, so it turns out that when you look after the people, uh, it is good for the environment. Um, so how far have you gone in achieving the goals? Well, we've uh, come to <clears throat> visit the land. I, I did talk a little bit about that. We have uh, the three of them with each, each of them having a worker-owned cooperative set of people in them. And then they'll have the multi-purpose building for um, uh, if there is lightning or any kind of uh, emergency, they, they will have a place to shelter themselves on site. So we're, uh, we have the plans for that already done as well. So having done the site inspection, we're ready to go and we've already identified universities that are, have been researched by this first group very carefully for already having the knowledge of these physical things that need to be done. And so as they come in and we're inviting them in, um, they will understand that they will take on the roles of the trio of worker-owned cooperatives. So they will be people who really know what they're doing and uh, the reason that they're, they're going to be living in these tents is because around the world where we have these brownfield sites, that's what people will be doing to be close to where their, their action is. They'll be living in tents. So we're gonna be testing that as well. So that's as far as we've gotten along there. The universities are being contacted, some of them already. And uh, then as we invite those students in, we're getting closer to what we're doing. COVID has, slowed everything down <clears throat> for everybody. And, uh, but we have to take into uh, consideration that they're going to be outdoors, which will be much more safe. So that's where we're going to start. And as soon as we start this one year trial, which could be early this coming year in 2021, uh, then we're uh, going to have that knowledge within a year after that. And at the year following that is where the books, the three books, one for each worker cooperative, the eBooks, are going to be uh, finalized and because they, they're already uh, partially done. And then they'll go into translations immediately after that so that we will have that following year, 2022, getting those distributed on the internet, the translation, the book eBooks in English and then in translation. Are you looking for more people to get involved? Yes, <laughs> we would love to have more volunteers. We are onboarding some volunteers right now through mm -hmm. Taproot Plus. Taproot Plus is from the Taproot, it's a program of the Taproot Foundation, which is sponsored by Citibank. Now the 
they are very professional in what they do in terms of providing volunteers for us. And they're good people. Um, finding that COVID has helped in that way, oddly. There are people are at home, many of them have these skills and they want to give up more time because they're not spending that time commuting to a job. The job is being done at home. And there are some people who are out of work at this time but who have major skills and are willing to do volunteer work while they're waiting for a new opportunity. So we have some volunteers that are coming on board. We also have developed uh, the uh, jobs, uh, the job um, descriptions for people we're gonna have bringing on staff when funds are coming in so that we hit the ground running with this. So that's as far as we've got at this point and we are ready to rock and roll. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how can people find you if they wanna get involved? All right, they can go to our website, number one, which is reapgoodness.org, O-R-G. And um, they can also, if they wish to contact me directly, uh, my email is my first initial, C, and my last name, Manetta, C Manetta, at reapgoodness.org. Mm. Lovely. Okay. So what kind of uh, systemic change do you think the world needs in general? Oh. <laughs> Where do we start and where do we end with that question? Uh, that is huge. What are the top three? Uh, Just give uh, us top, top three. three. Top three is um, um, our economic change mm -hmm. and moving toward uh, the sharing economies. Uh, we are a member of the New Economy Coalition. It's a set of both uh, American and Canadian nonprofits who are working on these alternate systems of sharing economies and cooperatives, which is the new form of systems that, um, that the world needs because we are doing that focusing on each other. Um, and that's a, a major change. The other one is how we eat. Mm -hmm. We've been conditioned, I'll use that term, to look at food based on flavor and taste sensations and not nutrition. We must move forward health-wise and to a whole food plant-based diets. We know of their successes and we of course want to provide those permanently for people. So that would be the sharing economy, whole food plant-based diet to take care of the illnesses that have been going around the world. I think it's China right now that has the highest incidence of diabetes in the world because they've taken up with uh, Western diet. And um, so changing our diet is critical. That's a system in itself. And then also our, our propensity to consume, to go into what is, I'm really encouraged seeing, which is the minimalist movement, especially by young people. When I grew up in the era of manufacturing, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> manufacturing is where this started. I worked at Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford started it, you understand the quest for consumption was built into my upbringing. And uh, uh, it still is, there are people who are just now who are retiring and trying to move into smaller homes and are saying, why did I buy all those things? That was also conditioning. You, you can't have manufacturing unless people buy what's manufactured. But we know that we have a finite earth and we're not going to go to other planets and bring back large amounts of, of elements from those planets to create more stuff. We, we need to go forward with a, a new form of consumption. Those are the three systems that I think are the ones that need the greatest change. If we truly successfully implement those with love as the basis, then we will have a new earth that is worthy of these new children who are here today and those who are going to be born. Lovely. Uh, that sounds like a good, good point to end on. Thank you so much, Carol, for joining us. Oh, you're so welcome, Alexander. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.